Welcome to the first episode of Angiopod, the podcast for vascular fanatics. This podcast is created to review high yield material for the vascular in training exam and the vascular boards. It's meant for vascular surgery residents and fellows, general surgery residents, medical students, PAs and NPs that work with vascular patients. This is your host AJ and I'm with Dr. Kuldeep Singh. Dr. Singh is the director of Vascular Lab and the associate program director for the Vascular Fellowship at Staten Island University Hospital. I also have two third-year general surgery residents, Ara and Zach, who have a keen interest in vascular surgery. Today's episode is about vascular imaging. Let's get started. Uh, so, Zach, tell us a little bit about carotid artery disease. Uh, so, for carotid artery disease, we typically use... Um, duplex ultrasound. Uh, to look, uh, the normal carotid artery waveform reflects a low resistance system, and this is due to the circle of Willis. Uh, the external carotid artery waveform reflects a high resistance waveform, and this is because it's an end arterial system. Uh, Zach, the uh, easy way that I remember that, because when you ask some medical students, they kind of get lost, which is high resistance, which is low resistance. Just you have to remember that the brain, which always needs blood, should be a low resistance system. Although I do know some people where it may be high resistance, but that's... <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, and the other thing is the, uh, the common, carotid common carotid artery waveform is uh, similar to the internal carotid artery system because that's where 80% of the flow is directed. And the way you judge this is uh, using uh, peak systolic velocities. Uh, so for the internal carotid artery, a normal peak systolic velocity is anything under 125 centimeters per second. Uh, moderate stenosis of uh, 50 to 69% will typically be somewhere from 125 to 230. And then anything above 70% uh, stenosis will have a peak systolic velocity above 230 centimeters per second. Zach, that's the consensus criteria, what you just quoted. Uh, just... For the, our listeners, you do need to remember there are more than one type of criteria, but typically what's used is consensus or a Washington criteria. The Washington criteria relies a little bit more on end diastolic velocities, and each lab is different. Uh, it is a little different. So, but again, what we're talking about the numbers that you, that you just quoted. This is a consensus criteria. Uh, the other thing you can look at uh, from the consensus criteria is uh, anything um, that has an ICA uh, EDV or end diastolic velocity above 100 centimeters per second is also concerning for high degree of stenosis. And the internal carotid artery uh, to common carotid artery peak systolic velocity ratio above 4 uh, is also uh, significant for above 70% stenosis. Okay, so you, you don't never look at one factor such as systolic or diastolic velocities or ratios. You need to look at the entire picture. You want to see what the systolic velocities are and diastolic velocities, the ratio, degree of calcification, and also spectral broadening. And that will give you the full picture uh, of whether there, there is some significant stenosis going on in the vessel or not. So, Dr. Singh, when do you typically get a CTA or an MRA for carotid disease? That's a great question, AJ. So the choice between CTA or MRA is usually physician-dependent or institution-dependent. But your question is when to get it. Uh, typically, you get a second study, a CTA, MRA, uh, typically when there is uh, equivocal findings on duplex. So say that uh, the vessel is too calcified and the velocities can't be adequately measured. Another reason to get it may be contralateral disease. So if the contralateral carotid is occluded or stenotic, you may have falsely elevated velocities. Uh, additionally, if you have uh, cardiac abnormalities, which may also skew the velocities, that's another reason to get uh, a, a second study or a confirmatory study. Uh, Ara, let's talk about some peripheral vascular disease. Uh, tell us about um, duplex criteria for lower extremity disease. Okay, so when we're talking about uh Arterial duplexes, we look at the waveforms. Uh, usually the waveforms are triphasic. Uh, and then if you see uh, peak systolic velocities greater than 230 uh, centimeters per second uh, at a lesion, uh, usually signifies a significant uh, stenosis. And um, the following features on duplex are important when we're working up uh, peripheral artery disease. Um, for mild disease, the diameter reduction is usually less than 20%. Uh, the waveform is triphasic and there's uh, spectral broadening is present. 
Uh, for moderate disease, it's usually uh, the reduction is between 20 to 49 percent. The waveform then changes to a biphasic form, uh, and you still uh, have the uh, spectral broadening. And there is also a uh, peak systolic velocity ratio, which you look at, which is uh, less than two. Uh, and then when you look at severe disease, uh, the diameter reduction is greater than 50%. Uh, the waveform turns into a monophasic form. Uh, you still uh, have the spectral broadening. And what's changed is the peak systolic velocity ratio is now greater than 2. All right. So what you just explained right now, or just give us an idea about, was the uh, duplex examination in the office, which probably is the most common procedure that we perform when patients first come in. But that tells you about the characteristics of the vessel, and it tells you uh, about the flow as well, but it doesn't really tell you anything about the, the, the physiology. Are there other tests that you can do in the office uh, or that you rather should be doing as well when you're evaluating these patients? Okay, so the two physiologic studies are the pulse volume recordings and the anchor brachial index. Uh, so for the pulse volume recordings, there's two things you assess. The uh, volume waveform as well as the uh, pre a pressure gradient between segments. Uh, usually the normal waveform is a rapid upstroke and a dichrotic notch on the downslope. Uh, for stenotic segments, you see a loss of dichrotic notch, loss of rapid upstroke, loss of the peak, and equal upstroke and downstroke times. Okay, for our listeners, uh, some medical students that might not know what you're talking about, uh, let me just uh, describe what we mean by rapid upstroke. So if when you look at this curve, it's almost like a triangle. It's a sharp upstroke, sharp downstroke. When you have a, a stenosis, uh, you will lose that, that sort of sharpness. It's, instead of a triangle, it's going to look more like a bell curve. And once you see that, that's uh, indicative of some sort of disease pattern which may be occurring above the level that you are looking at. Also, AJ, why don't you tell us how the test is actually done? Yeah, so to perform a PVR, you need to have a segmental cuff uh, pressure recordings as well as the waveform recording. And to do that, we place uh, automated cuffs uh, starting from the upper thigh all the way down to the ankle. And essentially what the machine is recording is this waveform as well as the segmental pressures in between these cuffs. And that's why the second portion of the PVR is also important. So if you see a pressure gradient of more than 30 millimeters of mercury, that signifies a significant lesion. It also helps us localize the lesion. So for example, if that gradient of more than 30 millimeters of mercury is between the thigh and the brachial, that signifies aeroiliac disease. If that same difference was between the upper thigh and the lower thigh, that means your femoral vessel is stenotic. Similarly, thigh and calf gradient difference signifies popliteal artery disease. And again, for infrapopliteal lesions, you're going to have that 30 millimeter mercury pressure gradient between the calf and the ankle. So what you're saying is the cuffs are placed at high thigh, low thigh, calf, and ankle? Correct. And what you're looking at is the pressure gradient between those segments. Correct. Okay. AJ, let's change gears here a little bit. Uh, let's talk about the visceral vessels, the celiac SMA, as well as the, the renals as well. Tell us a little bit more about the, the velocities and how do you do the, the testing. Right. So uh, ultrasound is a good test for visceral arteries as well, and you can visualize them in uh, a vast majority of the patient. A uh, little bit about the physiology. The normal fasting celiac artery waveform is biphasic. It's a low-resistance system, and it stays like this, whether you're eating or you're not eating. The SMA, however, has a triphasic high-resistance pattern when you're fasting. And when you uh, consume a meal, you're going to get vasodilation in the splanchnic system, and that's when you get a low-resistance biphasic waveform. And that's normal physiology. When you look at stenotic lesions in these vessels, the key velocities to remember is a peak systolic velocity of over 200 in the celiac artery signifies a stenotic lesion of over 70%. Similarly, in the SMA, a peak systolic velocity of over 275 signifies a stenotic lesion of over 70% stenosis. 
Another thing that I'd like to mention here is the end diastolic velocities. Uh, the cutoffs right now are 55 for the celiac artery and 45 for the SMA, but this level of stenosis is, is usually over 50%. Okay, uh, that's good. Just to um, point out that duplex uh, can be a little bit unreliable when it comes to uh, the visceral vessels. So typically, if you see a disturbance in velocities or disturbance in the vessel, uh, typically a ultrasound, uh, I'm sorry, a CAT scan or an MRA is suggested. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I think to study the visceral vessels, the CTA or the MRA is a better study. Exactly. Now, what about the renal arteries? That's always a, a tricky one. And I know the fellows, when they're reading these studies, they often ask, how do I know if there's a stenosis or not? Just tell us a little bit more about the renal arteries. Yeah. Uh, the fellows like to ask about it, and so does the boards. Um, so let's talk about it a little bit. You have um, your normal peak systolic velocities that are usually less than 180 centimeters per second uh, in the renal arteries. Uh, the end diastolic velocity is usually less than 50 centimeters per second. When you have a peak systolic velocity over 200, that suggests a narrowing of about 60%. An end diastolic velocity of over 150 centimeters per second is more suggestive of renal artery stenosis and usually signifies a stenosis of over 80%. That's good, but I always tell the residents or fellows that an absolute velocity of the renal arteries doesn't mean much unless you actually look at the velocities of the aorta. Uh, and you need to look at something called the renal aortic ratio. Do you know anything about that? Yeah, so uh, again, ratios are better on the duplex. So the renal aortic ratio is basically the peak systolic velocity ratio between the renal artery and the uh, aorta. And anything over 3.5 indicates a renal artery stenosis. And what about uh, resistive index? I don't uh, know if you've done your transplant rotation yet. Well, actually, as a senior, I'm sure you've done it. I remember when I did it, that was, uh, that was, that was the, the biggest thing is the transplant surgeon always wanted to know what's the RI, what's the RI? What does that mean, the resistive index, and what does that tell you? That's a good point. So, again, RI is a measure of the parenchymal function. And the way you calculate the resistive index is uh, by subtracting the peak systolic velocity from the end diastolic velocity and dividing it by the end diastolic velocity. Now, when you have uh, a normal RI is about 0 0.7, and the reason they like to test it is because it predicts improvement in kidney function after interventions on the renal artery. So if you have a high resistive index, means your parenchyma is not functional. So whether or not you treat the renal artery, you're not going to get um, improved creatinine or improved kidney function. Whereas a low RI below 0 0.5 suggests that you're going to get better improvement or an improvement in the creatinine after you treat the renal artery. I see. So the resistive index doesn't tell you about the renal artery. It just tells you about the parenchyma and how well the kidney will do after you revascularize. Correct. Okay. Uh, what about aneurysms, uh, aortic aneurysms? How do we test for these? Who do we screen and do we need to screen? Uh, so the only screening uh, that's really done in the U.S. right now is for men and women above 65 years old. And this is anyone who has ever smoked any cigarettes. And uh, this screening has been shown to reduce uh, AAA-related mortality. So you're saying 65 and above with a history of smoking? Yep, exactly. Okay. And as far as positive screening follow-up, uh, so for anyone who screens um, for a aneurysm of 3 uh, to 3.4 centimeters, uh, it's recommended to repeat the ultrasound in three years. Uh, anyone from 3.5 to 4.4 centimeters, uh, we recommend annual ultrasound. And anything above 4.5 centimeters uh, will require uh, CT angiography. Uh, okay, so what if uh, you have a patient that's had a repair? That end of asking the repair. How do you follow up those patients? AJ, you want to answer that? Yeah. So for patients who've had an EVAR, the current recommendations are the gold standard, I should say, is a CTA. But there is a group of patients that have high risk for renal failure. And for these patients, contrast duplex has shown to be equally effective in following these patients. The current SVS recommendation is to get one baseline CTA or contrast duplex at the first month uh, follow-up. 
following a repair. And subsequently, if you do suspect or you do visualize a type 2 endoleak or an increase in aneurysm size, the frequency of your follow-ups increases and you would typically perform the follow-up CTA or contrast duplex every six months for these patients. So what you're looking for is an endoleak. You're not looking for just the size of the sac. And AJ, is the follow-up the same for an open versus an endovascular AAA repair? So it's a little different for the open AAA repair. Uh, as long as the patient is asymptomatic, you just have to get a one-time non-contrast CT of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis to image the entire aorta, and that's at five years. Okay, very good. Uh, you guys want to talk about um, treatment? Uh, Zach, when do you treat, uh, at what point do you treat men, women, anything? Uh, so males are typically treated for any aneurysm above 5.5 centimeters and females uh, for aneurysm above 5 centimeters, uh, as well as any rapidly growing aneurysm. So if there's growth in a year above 1 centimeter or growth in 6 months above 0.5 centimeters, that's also indication for a pair. Yeah, that's good. Uh, we're going to cover more on this topic in our abdominal aortic section. Uh, but let's just uh, quickly see if you screen a patient that's positive for an iliac aneurysm. What are you going to do, Zach? Uh, so if an iliac artery aneurysm is less than 3 centimeters, you recommend annual ultrasound. And anything above 3 centimeters, um, you repeat the ultrasound in 6 months. Good. So, Ara, let's talk about DVTs, probably the most common consult you're going to get as a vascular resident or fellow. So when you're evaluating venous disease, uh, you look at four components. You visualize the vessel that you're interested in. You check to see if there's compressibility. Uh, you check to see if there's flow and if there's augmentation to flow. Uh, in normal uh, venous flow, it's uh, phasic with uh, respiration uh, and augmentation with the distal compression. Good. Uh, then how do you differentiate between acute and chronic DVTs? So when you look at acute and chronic, uh, you look at the size of the uh, the vein, uh, and you would see that it's distended. And in chronic, uh, it's reduced and fibro uh, fibrotic. Um, and then when you're looking at the echogenicity, uh, acute, uh, you would see a tri uh, echo lucent, and in chronic, you would see echogenic uh, thrombus that's in there. Uh, as for the compressibility, uh, acute is usually non-compressible, and in chronic, you would see reflux, uh, which uh, you would see on uh, the duplex. And as to the walls of the vessels, um, in acute, it's usually thin and smooth, and in chronic, it's usually thickened and fibrotic. Uh, when we were looking at flow, um, in acute DVTs, you usually don't see any flow across it. And in chronic, uh, there's usually reflux present with collaterals, which is a, some of the differences between acute and chronic. Yeah. Um, That's pretty good. Um, just a quick side note here. Uh, sometimes you get superficial vein thrombus. Uh, there are certain areas where you have to be careful, uh, and these are the at-risk for causing pulmonary embolism. So if you have a greater saphenous vein thrombus near the common femoral vein or the saphenofemoral junction or a short saphenous vein thrombus close to the saphenopopliteal junction, these are at risk. And the numbers to remember is the distance from the junction of less than 3 centimeter and the length of the thrombus over 5 centimeters. And these patients require therapeutic anticoagulation versus uh, venous thromboembolic prophylaxis. Okay, that's a good discussion on DVTs. Now let's talk about a topic, a topic where the fellows uh, typically don't pay attention to throughout their uh, training, except for the last two weeks when they're about to <laughs> graduate. And uh, now they have a lot of questions about it. And that's venous insufficiency, varicose veins, uh, and that type of uh, uh, situation. Uh, so, AJ, you want to take this one? Uh, how do you evaluate this patient? The patient comes in and they have varicose veins. Um, how do you, uh, yeah. what do you recommend? So, again, highly tested topic uh, for the fellows as well as the vascular integrated residents. Uh, you basically have your two uh, venous systems in the extremities. You have the superficial as well as the deep. The superficial system is more commonly affected, and mostly the pathology you're going to see with varicosities is reflux compared to obstruction. Uh, the way you do a reflux study on these patients is with the ultrasound. You're going to do 
measure the greatest saphenous vein segments every three to five centimeters, starting from the saphenofemoral junction. Uh, you have pneum uh, automated pneumatic inflation machines that help you capture the reflux. A reflux time of over 500 milliseconds is significant. The test is conducted with the patient in the standing position. And the other things that you want to uh, capture with the duplex is the route that the vessel takes, the diameter, as well as the distance from the skin, because that helps you plan your therapy. So talking about the diameters a little bit, uh, a diameter of uh, greater saphenous vein or an accessory saphenous vein that shows reflux has to be over 5.5 for it to be pathological. For the short saphenous vein, a diameter of over 5 centimeters is pathological. So uh, a, a good overview, a good way to remember this is just remember a reflux time of 500 milliseconds and a vein diameter that should be at minimum 5 millimeters in diameter. And uh, even the short saphenous vein, of course, needs to be uh, tracked. You typically identify this vein in the fascial triangle posteriorly. Uh, same um, method of performing the test at 3 to 5 centimeters, map out the entire route, and also measure the diameter. Uh, in terms of the deep system reflex, uh, isolated deep system reflex is rare, and you will most commonly see this associated with the superficial system. The only difference in the deep system is that the femoropopliteal reflux has to be more than 1,000 milliseconds uh, for it to be significant. Uh, but in the deep calf veins, it's still uh, a value of over 500 milliseconds that's significant. Okay, so you have the patient standing in a... Uh, agree? Yeah. Yeah, it should always be done in a standing position. And uh, typically, they compress the calf. Uh, a lot of times, the techs use their hands and they just squeeze with their hands. But the, the, the right way to do this procedure is you use a pneumatic um, cuff. Uh, it's a, it, it essentially squeezes the, the, the thigh uh, using a machine and then you look for a flow of blood into, into the saphenous vein. It should be going towards the head. Uh, you leave that uh, probe there and then you see how much of that blood is going, refluxing, how much is coming down. And again, 500 milliseconds is what you're looking for. So if it's longer than 500 milliseconds of retrograde flow of that blood, then you know that there is something wrong with that vein. And uh, just one quick note, uh, you also have to study the perforators. Those are the communicating veins from the deep and the superficial venous system. And uh, the value again remains same, a reflux of over 500 milliseconds. Uh, but the diameter for the perforators, the cutoff is 3.5 millimeters. Good to know. All right, guys, that concludes our first episode. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Do not forget to subscribe to our podcast to get the following episodes as soon as we release them. Also, do leave us comments and suggestions so we can improve the podcast for you.